Today we have a super awesome speaker, and that is Christopher, who is our CTO here at Tigera. Uh, if you're not familiar with Christopher, uh, his background is uh, he's original architect of Project Calico, uh, which is one of the most popular open source uh, tools for networking, uh, as well as policy isolation. Uh, of course, he works very closely with you know, our customers here at Tigera. And before that, he held solutions and engineering and architecture leadership positions at Metaswitch, uh, Big Switch, Telstra, Alcatel, and uh, many others, and has also chaired multiple IETF working groups. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Chris to talk about network segmentation in the cloud native age. Um, uh, thanks, Mike, for the for the handoff. And and folks, as, as Mike said, this is our, our first uh, webinar, so I figured this one I'll do sort of uh, casually and, and just uh, talk on the subject of network isolation and how why you might want to consider doing network isolation um, differently than you possibly have done in, in previous incantations, say in a virtualized or, or dedicated server environment. How, how does the container or cloud native world change the requirements or the demands of an, of an is, for network isolation? So I figured we'd just sort of talk about that. I've got a whiteboard behind me. Uh, which I can do some drawing on, but I, I didn't do necessarily slides. I figured this, hopefully turn this more into a conversation than uh, uh, something formal. So, but as Mike said, if you've got comments on on the format, et cetera, please, please make that and we'll, uh, you know, please, please make those comments and we'll adjust as we go. So um, anyway, let's, let's go ahead and get started with uh, a little bit on network isolation, the way we've always done things before. So if you think about the way we've done network isolation in the past, um, normally the assumption has been most network traffic is north-south and stays within a given application. So you think of the classical three-tier application where you've got a, a web front end, an application middle layer, and say a database back end, um, and that would be an application. You can think of that as a stack, and you might have multiple instances of that database for scale or multiple, applica multiple application servers or multiple web servers. But that was all within a stack. So for an example, something I'll be using later, uh, let's think we've got three classical application stacks in, in our environment. One is customer order entry, one is uh, or order entry, one is customer record, and say one is geolocation. So I've got those three applications and they're mainly running north south. They don't really talk east west to one another. And they're running in environments where the individual components exist uh, for longer periods of time. They may be dedicated servers, they may be VMs, but those, those instances last weeks or months or maybe even years, um, and they're pretty much manually configured. And, and so when you look at how we've managed isolation for those things before, it very closely mimics what we have always done for isolation, which is we create a Ethernet network uh, using, say, VLANs or VXLANs to stitch all of the components of each of those application silos together. So the order entry application has its own subnet. It sits on its own VLAN, say VLAN 1, and the geolocation uh, and, and customer record applications also have their own subnets and, and their own VLANs. And that worked for the way we used to deploy applications and the, the way those applications used to behave. And so you know, one could argue, why not just continue with that model um, going forward uh, in, you know, in a container world? Why, is, why are containers or cloud native environments inherently different? And uh, what I'll try and paint here is, is why they are different and how you might want to think about this differently going forward. So let's, you know, so now that's how we used to do things. Um, let's now think about why people are moving toward more containerized or, or cloud native environments. Um, there are a couple of drivers here. One, companies or people deploying applications want to be more agile. They want to deploy things faster. They want to iterate faster as well. So you hear people talking about the term CICD, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, of applications. So as your developers write code, um, you want to push that code out as fast as possible. 
Uh, you may want to push out multiple variants of that code and do red blue testing. And red blue testing is the idea of I'm going to make a change to this application, and I want to have some of my users end up getting one version and some of my users getting another version, see how people interact with those two versions. This is something a lot of the web scale folks do today. Um, and if you look at, at you know, uh, Netflix or Amazon or, or Google, they all, when they make application changes, might push out multiple variants of that application and ensure 20% of their customer base gets each of the new variants and they see, they watch people's interaction. Um, so that's, that, that's one uh, model. You might push out multiple versions of, of, a, of a given application. Um, you might want to then iterate very quickly. You see, okay, well, people are failing uh, on this version, so I'm going to push out a, a new version of that or uh, push everyone over to the version that, that people seem to interact with better. But you want to sort of do this fairly continually. In order to do that, we need to start thinking about making those applications, the pieces of code I'm pushing, smaller and simpler. So if we think about the way, again, the way we used to develop applications and the way a lot of applications still are, are developed today is sort of a waterfall model. It's a big piece of code. It's fairly complex. And you just can't go and, and rapidly iterate through that because there's a whole bunch of, of regression tests and te checking a whole bunch of different functions and features to make sure you didn't break anything. So one of the things that CICD brings with it is the idea of microservices. And the idea being, instead of writing a big piece of monolithic code, like an application server that sits between your web process and your database backend, that application server may be split into multiple components, each doing one or two well-defined things. And those components communicate with one another over the network. So now, instead of having one big piece of code, you have lots of little pieces of code, and each of those things are well understood, easy to test, able to, to iterate those more quickly and, and, and push those out more quickly. So when you hear people talking about microservices, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about taking large code, splitting up into little littler pieces of code that are more simple, easier to maintain, and then rapidly, potentially iterating through those as through the software development process. So now, instead of two or three applications, web server, application server database, you might have that application that you're offering to your customers. Now maybe made up of tens or maybe even hundreds of, of microservices, each doing a specific function. So that's one thing that's that's driving this. So the and now let's think about how this works. If I'm pushing things out fairly frequently and I'm making changes fairly frequently and potentially those components might change their behaviors as you go through the software development process, as, as, as you come up with new versions, this microservice before used to talk to these other two microservices, the next version might need to talk to three different microservices. So as you go through this process, the, the environment becomes much more dynamic. And if we started off, if we, if we keep trying to keep this sort of static provisioned environment that we talked about earlier, you're going to end up having issues where you just can't provision these things by hand fast enough, right? This eventually has become something that you have to automate the delivery of these applications. So this is where things like Kubernetes and Mesos and, and other container orchestration platforms come to play. So now the way you develop these applications is you tell your orchestrator, say Kubernetes, um, that you have this microservice, you want is this many of them, you, they need, you know, if one fails, you need to restart them, and I need them deployed somewhere in the fabric. So that's now being handled by the orchestrator versus a, a more manual deployment process. Like I want to deploy a VM into say OpenStack or VMware and that's still sort of a semi-manual process. This becomes a very automated process. You give a description of the microservice to the orchestrator and the orchestrator automatically deploys it. 
and deploys however many of those you want. So we now have a lot of moving parts, many more moving parts than we had before, and they're potentially living shorter periods of time, and they're being very automated. So if we now start thinking about what that means, if we start reserving infrastructure for these individual components, what we end up with is reserving lots of infrastructure. So we're going to, re the, the other thing that, that's driving this is resource utilization. What I really want when I start thinking about my resources in my cluster or in my, in my cloud is I have compute, I have storage, I have network, all those things, and I just want those to be undifferentiated. I don't want, you know, uh, pets as servers. I don't want some servers to be more important than others, or if this server breaks, I need to replace that server because my service is down. I, the orchestrator has been designed, these orchestrators have been designed to take the microservices, take the containers, uh, the microservices or, or chunkier, and redeploy them to other servers, right? So I now have no special services or special components or, or serv servers, et cetera, in the, in the infrastructure. They're all just general compute platforms, general networking platforms and storage, and any of them can be used for any service. So we've now got you know, a couple of things here. I've got an undifferentiated platform that I want to make full use of. And in order to do that, that means that any service can end up anywhere. So I don't necessarily want to reserve and pin things to individual components. That, that causes resource contention. I've got lots of endpoints, and they're changing much more rapidly. Um, and so these are some of the challenges you have as you move to a more cloud native or, or microservices based environment. So let's now take this new environment. And there's one other thing too, by the way, sorry, I forgot about one more point. We also no longer want to replicate um, the uh, development of code and, and uh, service. So I used to work at a very large carrier as, as the chief architect, and when I walked in, the carrier will remain nameless to protect the to protect the guilty. Um, when I walked into my role there, I discovered we had five different voice over IP platforms, and none of them shared anything in common. They were all from different vendors. They were all vertically integrated stacks because they all met a slightly different set of requirements, and that's just the way things were done. So we had five independent voice over IP platforms. However, most of the functions in each of those voice over IP platforms were served common capabilities. So for example, customer record authentication, each of those platforms each had their own integration into our, our OSS system, our customer uh, information systems. So you're replicating the same function in multiple different places. So that means every time we had to change, say, customer record format, you had to go make those changes in five different applications. And that leads to additional churn. And okay, we can't make this change to the customer record because four of the VoIP platforms have gotten the update. The other one is, is having problems and getting the update. So I can't make the change until that fifth one gets unstuck. So it'd be really nice to say, we're just going to have one software module that interacts with the customer record. And that software module can be used for all of the different applications that need to interact with the customer record. So as a microservice, there's a customer record, you know, polar or whatever it might be. So I really want to be able to make changes in one place and have them replicated across the infrastructure. So that brings with an, it an interesting uh, issue where now I have many more components that need to talk east-west. So I start coming up with these common platforms. I don't want to replicate my customer plat record system into each of my VoIP stacks. I don't want to replicate, <coughs> you know, whatever other um, applic thing I might have in the application, um, say patient records, if it's a medical system. I don't want to necessarily replicate 
uh, patient record infrastructure across multiple different um, silos. I want to do that in one place. I want to have one source of truth for that data wherever it exists. So as the applications become more interconnected, and as applications need to dip into more things to make them more useful, what I end up having to do is have more what's called east-west traffic. So we talked earlier about most traffic being north-south. Most Apple traffic came into the application and the legacy environment went out of the application. There wasn't a whole lot of traffic within the data center. It came in, did whatever you need to do in the application, went back out. So you could say early on in the data center environment, maybe 90% of the traffic was north-south. It was customer makes a request or user makes a request, gets an answer. Um, and only 10% would be across those silos that we talked about earlier. Today, you're seeing that shift dramatically to maybe being 50% of application traffic is across silos and 50% is north-south. You may even see in some places where 90% of the traffic is east-west. Applications talking to one another within your data center and only 10% is actually the traffic that goes external to the data center, requests coming in and, and, and final result coming back out. So I now have a number of different and that part of that is because I want one source of truth. I want one module to do something. I don't want to have to replicate that multiple times. So now we have a couple of things that have changed dramatically from where we started. So we now have more inter-application traffic. Uh, more of the traffic is inter-application. We have a larger number of components and they're changing much more frequently. So those are some of the changes based on the, the way we deploy applications. There's another set of things that have also changed. So let's, let's write those up first before we go on. So we have um, a more dynamic environment. Uh, more components we have more east west traffic so that's some of the things now let's think about some of the other and there you can see that so some of the other things are the, the threat environment has also changed. So if we think about the threat environment, uh, it used to be that attacks were fairly simplistic. Uh, people would try and hack through the passwords into your system, et cetera, and, and try direct attacks. Um, so fairly straightforward, fairly easy to protect against. You just put a wall around the outside of the infrastructure and theoretically that would protect you. Um, the world has changed though. So now, um, you know, if you start taking a look at a lot of the attacks from the Sony attack to the Google attack to uh, you know, a number of the other incidences that have happened over the last um, couple of years, um, there's something called advanced persistent threats. And so the idea is that some piece of code gets into your network and spends a very long time um, A, hiding itself, and B, mapping out your infrastructure, figuring out where things exist in your infrastructure. Where is that customer database? Where is the credit card record stored? And it might sit there quiescent and not detectable for months or years. And then once it's figured everything out and figured out how to exfiltrate the data, um, it receives a, a command from its command and control network to go do that. And now all of a sudden, you know, you've just had 10 million of your customers' credit card records exfiltrated out of your infrastructure. And the thing that did that has been sitting in your network for months. Uh, and in fact, if you talk to uh, folks in the US government that work with um, companies uh, around cyber threat, the, the common comment is there's exactly two types of organizations in the world, those that know they have an advanced persistent threat in their infrastructure and those that don't. 
There is no third class of you don't have an advanced persistent threat. There's just so many different ways of getting um, malicious code into your infrastructure. And some of that comes from you now lots of people use external code sources. You know, people don't write their own web servers. They go pull down Nginx. They don't write their own Python modules. They just go grab them from the net. That's one way of doing it. Uh, social engineering, spear phishing techniques. There's a myriad of ways of getting code into your infrastructure. But the, the short answer is you have to assume that your infrastructure has been compromised in some way, shape, or form. So what that means is you also need to start practicing <coughs> what's called a zero trust model or a least privilege. So if I build a big wall around my data center or my cluster, uh, the classic put the firewalls at the perimeter, that really doesn't do anything to stop the advanced persistent threat that's already inside your infrastructure. So what you need to start doing is being much more fine grained with who is allowed to talk to who. Not every component in your infrastructure should be able to talk to the customer uh, credit card records. Only things that you know should be talking to the customer credit card records, uh, say charging part of your application, should be able to do that. So you need to now be much more fine. In order to slow down these attacks or stop these attacks, you need to start applying rules of how you know the application behaves. There's no reason for uh, inventory control system to talk to your customer credit records. So why should it be allowed to do that? So what you probably want to do is put in rules to say that it can't talk to your PCI data store. And the only thing you can talk to your PCI data store is this one vetted component of the order entry system. Um, but you need some way of doing that. So, you know, that's another thing that drives us. So let's talk about, let's add into this we now have an increased need for zero trust. And basically the idea of zero trust is I protect my entire infrastructure, but I don't trust my infrastructure. I assume anything in my infrastructure can potentially be a bad actor. And that just doesn't need malicious code. That can also just be bugs written in software. I'm sure no one here works for a company that produces any bugs in their software, but you know, it does happen on occasion. So you know, a, a threat can be application misbehaves and saturates, you know, it has runway API calls and saturates another component and your in your your application goes down. So, you know, there's there's multiple threats, but you have to sort of assume that you are not going to trust anything in your infrastructure. So we that's now sort of the fourth component. So I've got zero trust, it's much more dynamic much more east-west, I have a lot more components and I wanna be more efficient about using all of this. So how does this affect the original network isolation model? And can the original network isolation model deal with this kind of environment? So before I go into that, does anyone have any questions or comments about the, the you know, the, the points that I put out there that are going to drive the rest of this conversation. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. So let's think about a, a simple uh, company. A company that's got a, a, just a couple of applications or services in their in their cluster that they want to offer. So we'll start off that that this was a company that has three applications and they started off in a uh, VM environment and now they're moving to a uh, more containerized model. So they have three applications and we'll call these um, order entry, customer record, and geolocation. Those are the three things, three applications that they've got. 
So they started off with these things, each in their own VLAN, like we talked about before. So this is in VLAN 1, this is in VLAN 2, and this is in VLAN 3, or VXLAN 1, 2, and 3. It doesn't really matter for this conversation. And inside of order entry, you've got some number of um, you've got some number of services, microservices, and let's say we've got a couple of different types here. We've got type A, type B, and type C. And same thing over here. We've got customer in the customer record area. We've got Again, some number of containers, and some of these are going to be type F, G, E, and H. And over here in geolocation, I think you can see where this is going. We've got some number of containers, and these are going to be type X, Y, and Z. So this is sort of a standard thing right now. They're each just talk within their own network. This is all great. What this does mean, however, because these are separate VLANs, is that we're going to now assign address blocks to each of these things. So each of these things is going to have a subnet associated with it. That's fine. So we're, we're we figured out how to do that, stay in Kubernetes, and, and everything's working fine. Now, somebody says, well, you know, what we really need, though, is in order entry, we need to check to see if the customer is in arrears on their record, on their, on their, uh, uh, on their account. So we need to do, and we're not going to accept an order if they're in arrears, they haven't paid their bills. And in that case, the B component here is a credit checking function. And it needs to dip into um, G, which is the customer credit record. It's a subset of the overall record. So we now have a requirement that Bs need to talk to Gs. So let's think about how we do this in a legacy environment. B can't talk to G. They're in different networks. They're in different segments. So what you end up doing is putting a firewall between VLAN 1 and 2. And this firewall has a rule that A can talk to G. But the way firewalls do this is via IP addresses. So you would assign, or Bs talk to Gs, I'm sorry. The way you would do this is you would sign Bs You'd list all the, the B addresses, and you'd list all the G addresses, and you'd put a rule in here that says these IP addresses can talk to these IP addresses. And in the legacy world, where these things don't change that often, that's fine. But we've talked about the fact that Bs and Gs could be changing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, or a day-by-day -day basis, or an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And you really can't, in a Kubernetes environment, say I want these things to have specific addresses. You can, but you're going to break lots of other things. So I now have a problem where every time someone deploys a new B or a new G or another one gets stood up, all of a sudden we've got a, a big order. It's around Christmas time. So I now stand up a couple more Bs and a couple more As. And so I now created more Bs. I now need to go update this firewall with the new B addresses and the new G addresses. The firewall isn't really talking to the orchestrator. It, it has no concept of that. It's just a classical firewall. So great. I now have a system where I can roll out new versions of Bs in minute by minute basis, but I now need to go raise a firewall change request to the firewall guys. And I'm sure everyone on here um, as perfectly functioning organizations, but as a general rule, opening a firewall ticket can literally take days or longer to resolve. So fine, I've got this great, I can rapidly iterate, I'm, I'm meeting the requirements of the business, but 
you know, so I'm iterating on B every five minutes on the B function or every four times a day or whatever, but each time I do that, I need to wait for a firewall ticket to be open. Probably not going to work. So what I now need to do is create a different subnet or a different VLAN, a couple different ways of doing it, for Bs. So now I carve out another network range for Bs. And I carve out another network range for Gs. So before, we had a network range for 1, 2, and 3. But now I actually have a network range for 1, everything else, and Bs. And so I've got everything other than Bs, and then I've got B, a separate range for Bs. And then I do the same thing. I've got a range for 2, everything but Gs, and I've got a range for Gs. And 3s we don't need to worry about yet. So I now have, instead of three segments in my network, I now have five segments. But, so I do that, and then I can put in this rule here in the firewall, and again, life is good, except I've now done more constraint to my infrastructure. You know, bees, if I, bees might eventually become 100 bees, I need to make sure I've got at least 100 addresses reserved for bees, create this other segment, etc. So okay, this is now working. It's starting to creak, but I've got this working. Now, somebody comes along and says, ooh, people in Germany can't order these products. So in that case, the X application, the X service and geolocation is the um, finding out if a or is the IP address to a uh, geolocation service. So now I need my A's to talk to X. So now I have a new rule, A's needing to talk to X. So I stand up another firewall here, and I put in the rules for A needs to talk to X. So, Guess what? Since we've already said we can't manually add these things, I now need to create new segments for A needing to talk to X. So I now have segment for one, everything but B and A, which just basically means C, and B and A. And then I've got a, range, a segment for two, everything but G's and G's. I've got a segment for everything three, but X and X. And as I start reusing more and more components across my infrastructure, this will grow and eventually become the pro cross product of every single microservice potentially in the infrastructure. So I now have an N squared issue where as more and more of my microservices end up having to talk to one another, if I'm using classical uh, segmentation, I end up with an n squared problem of creating the number of segments that match to any possible combination that, of microservices that may want to talk to one another. So this is great. I've got six microservices here, and I'm already at you know, seven segments. You know, and if it, you can sort of do the math on, on where this goes. So as your application, as your environments become more complex, the number of segments you're managing become more complex. Now let's throw another wrench into the works and say that A, let's say X now also needs to talk to H. This is another customer record component. And basically I want to validate that a customer really is in a given location. So now I need X to talk to H. Now this becomes really interesting because now I create a new rule as H needs to talk to X. So I put H needs to talk to X in here. But now X needs to be in a range that handles both A and H. But A doesn't need to talk to H. 
So now I start to end up creating even more and more segments to try and find grain to isolate all this stuff. And this really becomes unmanageable really, really quickly. So, you know, at the end of the day, this becomes an n squared problem and it's going to be a nightmare to manage. And you're going to have to try and figure out at some point in the future what all these ranges were and are they still relevant. So this probably is not the way to build your microservices infrastructure going forward. Before I go into the way maybe you do want to think about that, let me pause here for a second and see if anyone's got any questions. Okay. So what you can do instead is let's not segment these things. There, there's another problem here too, by the way. I now have two methods for isolation. If you're in one, you can talk to one, and that's done via VLAN or a VXLAN. If A is trying to talk, if B is trying to talk to G, that's going through a firewall. So there's another segmentation point. So now when something can't talk to something, I now have two places to check. Is it in the right VLAN? And when it wasn't the, it's in the right VLAN or not? And is it in the right firewall or not? So now I have the issue of having multiple places where I do the same thing, which is segmentation of my network or isolation of my network. So let's think about this a different way. So let's think about this instead. I've got a number of servers. And by the way, what I'm going to show you is sort of the way Kubernetes network policy works. And I'll talk about, I'm not gonna talk about the details, different ways of, of, of implementing it, but let's just talk about the general practice. So now I've got on the servers, so what's really happening in the infrastructure is I might have, have some A's and some X's and some G's. And over here, I might have some B's and some G's and some Fs and you know so on and so forth. Let's call these. I got a C over here and another G and then a Y or whatever over here. So I have these workloads. One of the things that allows orchestrators like Kubernetes to work is metadata. So each of these workloads has labels attached to it that say what it is, what it's supposed to do, etc. So we can label these things as this is workload type A and it belongs to application one. And this one is workload type G and it belongs to application two. This is workload X type three and you can assume all the way down. I don't care what IP addresses are here. What you do need to do is now write some policy. And this policy can be pretty generic. I can write a rule that says things that are A and one, well, actually I can write a policy that says things labeled one should be able to talk to things labeled one. And things labeled two should be able to talk to two and things labeled three should be able to talk to three. But I can also say things labeled B should be able to talk to G and things labeled um, C, if I remember right, should be allowed to talk to things labeled X and things labeled, um, I forget if it was H, I forget what it is. So I'd say, let's say these were, um, I forgot what the other one, yeah, H should be allowed to talk to X. So those are my policies. I make no assertions about what network they belong to or anything else. Just things labeled one should be able to talk to things labeled one, two, three, et cetera. So now somehow on this host, and that's sort of up to the implementation, and Calico's got a very interesting implementation here, you would provide a filter that basically says on this host, usually, that knows these rules. 
So when A1 tries to talk, when this thing tries to talk to another one, which might be over here, or on the same host, if this thing's trying to talk to a destination one, the filter on this implementation is going to know that that's allowed. So it'll allow that traffic to get sent to whatever one it was trying to talk to. If this thing was trying to talk to a two, it's going to get blocked because ones aren't allowed to talk to twos unless it was trying to talk to a G. You know, if this was B1 instead, so if this tried to talk to a two, it wouldn't work. However, if B1 was trying to talk to G2, because B is allowed to talk to G, that would be allowed. So now what you use is these policies to describe how your applications talk to one another. It should be something you already understand. And by simply changing these policies, the infrastructure allows these communications or not. We don't involve networking per se. You might render this to networking, but these aren't networking constructs. We don't have VLANs, VXLANs, subnets, firewalls. This is simply an enforcement of a policy. Now, it doesn't matter if there is one A1 or if there's a million of them, or they come and go, because each of them has a label on it, and that label draws in a specific set of policies. What this also now allows you to do, remember we talked about zero trust, these rules sort of suck for zero trust. One allowing one, two allowing two, and three allowing three. So eventually, you can make these more and more fine-grained by saying A should be able to talk to Bs on port 80, and A should be allowed to talk to Cs on 8080, but A shouldn't talk to Bs on port 8080, or whatever that might be, even within one. So you now start as you understand your infrastructure better, you can start scoping down what's allowed to talk and eventually come up with everything. Nothing's allowed to talk to anything else unless there's a policy that specifically allows it. So that is possibly a way, well, it's not possibly, this is a way out of the conundrum of the cross-product segmentation issue that you will have if you continue to bring the legacy model of coarse grain VXLAN or VLAN based segmentation into a world that is much more dynamic and much more, um, uh, much more east west traffic, microservices, zero trust, et cetera. All of those things really are going to make the existing model, if not untenable, at least really, really difficult to deal with. And there's much simpler ways of doing this. And, and this model that we're talking about here. Is supported by a number of different platforms that are out. It's just on Calico. There's a number of different platforms that are now supporting this kind of model. We think ours is sort of cool, and we can talk to you about it later. But um, you know, here the real idea is to use policy and metadata or labels versus networking constructs to provide uh, your isolation. And this can be as fine grained or as coarse grained as you want. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Chris, I have a question. I'm actually going to ask you a question about uh, Project Calico, if that's okay. Um, how, do, how does Project Calico actually enforce the policies? So the way we do it is with IP tables and IP sets rules in the Linux underlying Linux kernel. So we actually, if you want to think of it, we distribute a firewall right down in front of the endpoint, and that firewall is dynamically programmed by that metadata that we're talking about. Um, we can go into a lot more details about it, but Basically, what we've done is is anchored the labels on the uh, containers or the VMs or whatever we're we're protecting um, to those policies, and then we render that right on right in front of the workload. So even if two workloads, two pods, for example, on the same server want to talk, they have to go through that filter. Uh, there is no there is no way around that in the infrastructure. Did I answer your question, Mike? That does, that does. And I have another uh, question in the Q&A for you. Uh, and that is, is an overlay network a carryover of the existing segmentation construct? Um, yes. 
basically, there's two reasons why you might do an overlay. You either want to carry over the existing segmentation model, or B, um, you're carrying, well, there's, sorry, there's three. I think there's a Monty Python skit about that, but there really is three. Um, one is carrying over that existing segmentation model. Two, you need to transport things other than IP packets. And I'm not sure if too many cloud native things are using IPX or Apple Talk or raw Ethernet frames. So um, since most of, say, the Kubernetes infrastructure, et cetera, is IP only, um, policies like this might be IP only. If I need to transport something non-IP, the way of doing that might be um, via some kind of L2 overlay. However, uh, I'm not aware of anything really today that is not talking IP. Uh, there may be some people who believe you need to do an L2 overlay to make some IP functions work, and that is usually a false assumption, but you know, there might be a few corner cases. The third is if you are, um, if you're basing this on IP, again, that's sort of the assumption in cloud native world is everything's IP. Um, if you have overlapping addresses, you might need to do some kind of encapsulation to prov provide for the ability to have two 10.1.1.1s in your infrastructure and, and be able to differentiate them. However, when you talk to most people who are running at scale, um, overlapping addresses cause much more grief and troubleshooting night headache than they solve. So most folks who are going to things at scale are trying very hard and most have been successful in not using overlapping addresses. That becomes potentially, um, if you're doing a, a public cloud where you're offering cloud services to other folks, that may become a bit of an issue. Uh, but even there, I'm seeing people uh, trying to drive customers to not bring their own addresses. But th there's multiple ways of handling that. One of those, though, is using an overlay. Okay, awesome. Uh, and by the way, if people do have questions, uh, feel free to ask the question either in the Q&A or the chat. We're monitoring that. Um, next question for you uh, is, uh, if we understand correctly, uh, the question is, is the biggest gain uh, in using labels uh, instead of IP blocks to define, like defining rules, is that the biggest gain? So I think there, there's a couple of reasons why labels are, are interesting. First of all, you know, any resource in, in these kind of environments should be considered fungible. So the minute I try and make certain addresses special, I have to treat them as special. I need everyone in the infrastructure to know that these addresses are special. So that is, you know, that, that sort of breaks the model of there are no pets, there are no snowflakes. So an IP address is just a consumable resource that should be fungible and ephemeral, um, much like a CPU or anything else you might have in this infrastructure. So um, it also means that if I'm going to do IP address ranges, I need to scale my IP address ranges to handle the maximum size that that particular policy that I'm attaching to the IP address might grow to. So you know, if I now think that I've got 10 Bs, like I said, if I just sign 10 address, a block of 10 addresses or 16 addresses to B, that's fine. But if all of a sudden I end up with 24 Bs, I, exhaust, I run off the end and I can't provision more addresses to Bs, even though there's more addresses in the infrastructure. So now B fails. So I then, what I have to do is assign a bigger block of B to handle the, the peak or burst demand of B. So let's say B could scale to 256 addresses potentially. So now I assign 256 addresses for B, even though most of the time B only has 10. So that means there are now 246 addresses that could be used elsewhere. They're now locked up in B. 99% of the time B is not using it. And again, that's, again, you're making snowflakes and you make snowflakes, you cause issues with resource utilization and bookkeeping and management, etc. So instead by using labels to do this. I don't care what the IP address is. Um, I use the labels as an identifier for the policy. And labels are, you know, uh, basically infinite. You know, it's a, I can attach the same label to a number of different workloads. So you can now start thinking of labels as being 
not per workload, but per function or per um, uh, per um, oh, what's the word I'm thinking about? Um, characteristic or personality. So a given, say, a front end uh, customer order uh, uh, processing uh, container or pot workload might be an LDAP client because it needs to look up the user's login. It might be a syslog client because it needs to log information out. It might need, might need to be a customer record client and it might need to be a um, order, you know, uh, uh, might need to be an inventory checking client. And there might be other things that are LDAP clients or other things that are inventory checking clients that aren't um, applications uh, aren't, aren't order entry applications. So you might have other things to say reordering uh, uh, workload that goes through and reorders things that are low in your stock might also be inventory checking clients, but they won't be LDAP clients or other things. So now I can say there's a policy for order, you know, for uh, inventory checking clients, and I can attach that to multiple different workloads, and the policy is still the same. The policy says order entry, uh, um, inventory checking clients can talk to the inventory server on port 8080. And then uh, those could be order entry clients, those could be uh, inventory checking clients, but that doesn't mean then that the, or, that the inventory checking, uh, the uh, order ordering clients uh, back, you know, the, the inventory checking clients get LDAP privileges. That's granted by the LDAP client label in there and its policy. So it, it's much more flexible than using IP addresses. Long answer, short question, sorry. No, oh, great answer. And actually just got one of my, uh, one of my favorite questions uh, just came in. Um, and that is with Istio, because Istio you know, does take care of filtering and also handles uh, routing. Um, and so is that kind of the next step to defend against advanced persistent threats or you know, how does Istio come into play uh, you know, with <laughs> Calicore networking. Sure. So um, the Istio provides another, if, we, if you want to look at it, how Istio and Calico, for example, or any network policy framework can work together, is the network policy can deal with L3 and L4 filtering, uh, usually fairly efficiently. Uh, but it, there might be some things where you say, it's not sufficient for me to say that um, order entry clients can talk to inventory checking server or credit checking server, let's say that, um, on port 443, I actually only want them to be able to do reads against a specific URI, you know, and that URI would be that, you know, uh, a, a flag in the order entry system, in the credit system that says that customer's in, in good state or not. So I don't want it to be able to make any query to the customer uh, credit record. I just want to be able to make that one credit, that one specific query. And I might decide to do that as a URI level filter in something like Istio. So it, it, it's additive, it's not replacing. Nice, so just so I understand correctly, while well, Istio takes care of like layer five through layer seven, you know, the application layer does the routing and load balancing and policies that at that level, it's not necessarily handling things at the network level like layer three and four, which is where Calico. There are some overlaps. There, 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 there definitely have capabilities at L4 at least as well. And I think that's one of the things we're, you know, talking about in the community as to, you know, how we, um, you know, what's the, the, you know, I don't want to call it swim lanes, but you know, what's, you know, what do you do in the right places? And I think there's tools the the goal here should be to render a policy. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, if you decide to implement that policy, if the underlying infrastructure implements that policy at, at L3, L4, a network policy tool or, or using Istio, um, it is you know, something that to the developer should be um, transparent. You know, it should be, you know, I want this to be able to, to have this policy effect. Uh, and, and how that gets done is, is should be independent and you, know, you do use the right tool for the right job you know not not everything isn't not everything is a nail um you know it is if you've got a hammer but here we've got a hammer and a screwdriver and some things are nails and some things are screws 
Yep, that makes sense. Okay, I got two more quick questions for you, and I think we're gonna run out of time here. Uh, the first one, really quick and easy, uh, is Calico IPv6 ready? Calico has been IPv6 ready from day one, uh, and we've actually proven, we have people using Calico for IPv6 on OpenStack. Um, we also have proven, uh, if you give IP6 addresses to Kubernetes workloads, uh, Calico will, will filter those and route those and do all those things with it. Obviously, Kubernetes isn't quite v6 ready yet. Uh, that's being worked on, but uh, Calico will be ready when you know, the orchestrators are ready. So yeah, we, we are v6. We're v6 capable. Perfect. And sorry to rush you here, but last question that we have: uh, Can Calico be used with other container scheduling frameworks such as Docker, uh, Mesos, uh, or ECS? Sure. So yes, uh, we support a the Calico project supports a number of different uh, orchestration systems: OpenStack. Uh, Mesos through network modules, uh, Docker uh, via CNM, uh, Rancher, uh, there's a number of, of different container environments. Pretty much anything that supports um, CNI or CNM um, is, you know, is supported or, or should work. We don't test against everything, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's pretty wide coverage. As far as ECS, um, I'm not sure we've tested against ECS. Um, that, that one, probably have to get back to you as an answer on that, if, if, how that would work. Awesome. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have here. Uh, really appreciate uh, you know, the insights and the wisdom here. And of course, uh, if people have more questions, feel free to you know ping the Tiger Twitter handle at tigerio uh, or visit uh, www.tiger.io to ask questions there. Of course, you can also ask uh, on projectcalico.org. Uh, and speaking of which, just one last thought, especially if we look at Istio, because you know Istio is is you know so new, but also such an incredible tool, and one that you know we we obviously uh, think quite a bit of. Uh, you can really learn a lot more about how Project Calico and Istio work together on the Project Calico blog. Uh, Spike uh, actually put together a uh, Spike and Strab actually put together a great series, a three-part series on you know what Istio is, where it excels, Project Calico, and how you can use both of them to really maximize both you know, the routing, but also the uh, security and isolation. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll let you guys go. Thank you.